So how do we generate energy from fossil fuels? Well, we burn them and we produce carbon dioxide and water vapor, as I've said. How well do we do that? Well, large-scale electric power plants, which are one of the primary uses of fossil fuels, particularly coal, but also increasingly natural gas, not much oil is used in that uh, place. Um, large-scale electric power plants, traditional ones, are only about 40% efficient. That is, for every unit of energy in the fuel, only about 0.4 units of energy come out as electricity. What happens to the other 60%? Well, it's usually discarded to the environment as waste heat. And that can be a problem in itself. That's called thermal pollution. That, think about that again. We have a huge amount of coal we're going to burn. It contains a lot of energy. And we throw away about two-thirds of the energy, about 60% or more of the energy that was in that coal. We literally throw it away. We typically throw it into a river. If it was going to harm the river too much by raising its temperature, we typically run it through those huge cooling towers, which you may associate with nuclear power, but are just as much needed for coal-burning power plants. Uh, we cool down that water before we discharge it to the river. And that water contains most of the energy that was in the coal. What a waste. By the way, uh, that waste is not just the result of poor engineering. It's also a result of a fundamental law of physics, the second law of thermodynamics. And if you've taken my course, Physics in Your Life, I have a discussion there of the second law of thermodynamics and how it poses severe limitations on our ability to extract energy by any process that involves heat, combustion of fossil fuels, fissioning of uranium, whatever. There are more advanced fossil technologies um, that are called um, combined cycle power systems. And these combined cycle power systems use a device like a jet aircraft engine, which in itself is a rather inefficient device for converting heat to mechanical energy. But they take the waste heat that comes out of the basically jet aircraft engine, it's called a gas turbine, and they use that to run a conventional steam turbine. And that combination results in efficiencies as high as about 60%. Combined cycle power plants, they're called. So we're still throwing away about 40% of the energy. You can do still better, and that's to do something called cogeneration, in which you have a power plant that generates electricity in a, the context of a situation, maybe a community that needs heat, maybe an industry that needs steam for some industrial process, and you use what would otherwise be waste heat for this, uh, this, these processes that require heat, but not necessarily electricity. That's called cogeneration, and that's an even more efficient thing to do. There are whole cities in Europe that are heated with the waste heat from power plants, and so there you're extracting the energy and putting it to good use, and the power plant is therefore much more efficient in using the energy stored in the fuel. Another major use, of course, of fossil fuels is in powering most of our transportation vehicles. Nearly all our transportation, with the exception of electric trains and a few nuclear-powered ships, is powered by fossil fuel. Uh, fossil fuels. Another exception would be um, vehicles powered by biomass, for example. But the vast majority of the world's fleet of vehicles are powered by fossil fuels. And they're only about 15% efficient at converting the energy stored in the fossil fuels to uh, the mechanical energy of the wheels of the car. Now, this sounds dismal, but it's also a reason for hope because it means we could do a lot better in using fossil fuels efficiently. Let me mention one other thing about fossil fuels. All the fossil fuels are in limited supply. For coal, well, maybe not so much for coal. Coal, we have enough coal to last a number of centuries. But the remaining reserves of oil, and there's a lot of debate about this, and I don't think the debate has been resolved clearly. There are a lot of debate, but the remaining reserves of oil, and probably of natural gas also, are most likely measured in decades, not centuries. And you can quibble about when we will reach the peak of oil people talk about. But there will come a time when the oil production in the world peaks and begins an inexorable decline. And if the demand for oil is continuing to rise, we will have a real energy crisis then. Not when we run out of oil, not when we pump the last drop from the ground, but when that peak occurs. Um, that peaking occurred for the United States in the early 1970s. Demand continued to rise, and we made up that demand by importing oil from elsewhere. That's why the United States imports such a huge amount of oil every day. Um, if we were the whole world, though, there is no other place to import it from. And I don't frankly know whether we're going to have a crisis over the peaking of oil or not. There are some people who are sure that crisis is imminent. There are others who would argue we will slide away from that crisis by switching to alternative sources of energy, both within the fossil realm and outside the fossil realm, and we'll never confront that crisis. Uh, most people would argue we will not confront that crisis for coal because we will never be able to burn all the coal in the ground because of the effect on the climate will be too great. So that's fossil fuels. They cause regular pollution, they cause climate change, and they are in limited supply.
I mentioned the geothermal and tidal energy flows. We can, in some limited places around the Earth, extract significant amount, amounts of energy from the ground, particularly in areas that are geothermally active, which unfortunately also tend to be among our scenic areas. Imagine tapping into Yellowstone National Park, for example. We can supply a significant amount of energy in those localized regions. There are some issues. There are pollution issues. There are groundwater depletion issues. There is land subsidence. These are not ideal energy sources. Um, and they are limited in the regions where we can use them, and they cannot ever make a major contribution to the Earth's energy supply. An exception would be if we learned to dig very, very, very deep into the hot rocks, very, very far down, and extract energy from them. Those hot rocks underlie the entire planet, but they're very hard to get to technologically, and I doubt that that's going to be a viable energy source in any reasonable time. And even then, the overall flow of geothermal energy is still small. It may be larger than what we human beings use, but not much larger. So it's not really going to help us out all that much. So geothermal power, in my mind, although it may be the answer in a few localized places, is simply not the answer or a, a, a viable answer. Nuclear fuels are another story. Today, nuclear energy supplies about 6% of the world's energy, and as we saw, about 8% of the United States energy. And of the two non-fossil energy sources that are in widespread use, it's one of two where the technology is developed, established, we know how to make it work, we can argue about whether it's economical, we can argue about whether it's environmentally sound, but we do know how to make energy from nuclear fuels, at least in one of two possible ways. If you look at the energy that's stored in the atomic nucleus, you will find that very light nuclei, like hydrogen and helium, don't have a lot of energy stored in them, or, they're, they're, or didn't... It didn't take a lot of energy to make those nuclei. Very heavy nuclei, like uranium, also took less energy to make than the intermediate nuclei, like iron, for example. Iron is the most tightly bound nucleus. In the making of iron, a huge amount of energy was released. And what this means is, if you take a heavy nucleus, like uranium, and split it in half, you will release energy in producing elements that weigh sort of more middle range like iron. Similarly, if you take lightweight nuclei like hydrogen and fuse them together, you will release a lot of energy as you produce heavier nuclei. That process is called fusion. The former process is called fission. We know technologically how to harness fission to generate energy, particularly to make electricity. And that's where that 6% of the energy from nuclear sources is coming from. We do not know yet how to make fusion energy do anything useful for us except blow things up with nuclear thermonuclear weapons. We do know how to make it work there. Nuclear fusion, by the way, is what powers the sun, and so that's the ultimate source of most of the energy that comes to Earth. But we do know how to make nuclear fission work, and there are some 400 nuclear fission power plants worldwide. They produce highly radioactive waste, um, and a lot of people are focused on that problem, and it is a problem. On the other hand, uh, a large nuclear power plant uh, in a course of a year, if you condensed it, com compacted its waste, that waste would probably fit under the table I'm speaking in front of, whereas um, a coal-burning power plant of comparable size to a large nuclear plant produces a thousand tons per hour of carbon dioxide, a thousand tons per hour. And that's, uh, uh, that, that's uh, indicative of a difference between nuclear energy and chemical energy, the kind of energy in fossil fuels. It's a difference of a factor of about 10 million in the concentration of energy. And that's both the the great thing about nuclear energy, and it's also the danger of nuclear energy. This very highly concentrated energy allows a nuclear power plant to be refueled once every year or so with a couple truckloads of uranium, while a, while a fossil fueled power plant is refueled several times a week with 110 car trainloads of coal that are coming from, uh, in the United States, places like Wyoming where they're being strip mined, or places like West Virginia where the whole tops are being removed from mountains to get at this coal. There's a lot of anxiety over nuclear power. I, I personally think some of that anxiety is a little bit displaced, but my biggest worry about nuclear power is its connection to nuclear weapons and the possibility that any society or group that has access to nuclear power technology, it isn't the same as nuclear weapons technology, but they have some of the expertise to make weapons. I personally believe nuclear power is a lot less harmful for the environment than burning fossil fuels, particularly coal to make electricity versus nuclear fission. But all bets on that opinion would be off if we were ever to have a nuclear uh, war that resulted from nuclear power giving people the wherewithal to build nuclear weapons. So uh, I think nuclear energy, although it could replace some of our fossil fuels, has some problems we need to think about.
And in particular, nuclear fission cannot, at least at present, nuclear power in general cannot at present replace our transportation fuels. Maybe in a future with hydrogen fuel cell cars, we can make, fuel cell, make, make hydrogen from, from um, nuclear energy, but not yet.